All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Kelly Lippincott. I organize the virtual events for our Art and Courts um, memory care communities across the, the, we have 54 communities, I think it is. And uh, today we're gonna be talking about dining and dementia. I wanna say a few housekeeping items first and then we're gonna go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. Um, this webinar will be recorded and in a few days it will be emailed to all the registrants who have registered for this webinar today, as well as the PowerPoint slide deck, which you will see today. Um, it will also be uploaded to the virtual events page, which I typed in the chat room just now. Um, so you just got to give me a day or two to get it, uh, the recording situated and um, translated into our web format, and then we will upload it for you. And you can watch it anytime for free. Um, today's webinar, we are going to be going through the meat of our presentation first, because we have a lot of people who are going to be joining us today. Uh, so we'll go through the meat of the presentation and then what we'll do is we'll open up the chat room afterwards and we will answer as many questions as we can in the time possible. And after the webinar, you can ask about any questions related to dementia and dining. Um, I know this is a challenge for many caregivers, so I'm glad that we can present this for you today. So let me go ahead and introduce our speakers. Nancy Gurry Linick. She is our Senior Food Services Coordinator who works out of our Art and Course ProMedica Memory Care community located in Avon, Connecticut. She's been with the company for 19 years, um, but she also has 30 years of culinary experience. So she is a wizard in the kitchen, you could say. Our Pauline Coram, who is also joining us today, is the Director of Education and Development for ProMedica Prometicus' assisted living division. Pauline has created and incorporated many dementia programs across our um, Prometicus memory care communities. And I'm so happy that our friends could join us today to talk about this very important subject. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce Nancy and Pauline. Welcome. Thank you, Kelly, and welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us this beautiful summer morning. Food is universal and connects us to our most cherished moments. Loved ones living with dementia should continue to experience connections over a meal. It should provide much needed structure and time to enjoy family and friends. I've been cooking and creating for over 30 years and appreciate this time to share my experience and thoughts with you today. And we're gonna to start with um, uh, Pauline now and um, I will see you all a little bit later. Thanks, Nancy, and thank you. Hey, we look forward to speaking about one of my favorite parts of the day every day, and that's food. There are some that live to eat and some that eat to live. I, for one, live to eat. I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce today's conversation, healthy eating for people living with dementia. Let's begin by a quick review of the brain, dementia, and its effects on the brain. Why don't we get started? The brain is very complex. It's comprised of 100 billion with a B nerve cells and 100 trillion with a T connections or transmitters. These are the messaging transit system of the brain. For those who owned encyclopedias before Google and Siri, the brain can hold five times as much as the Encyclopedia Britannica. Think about that. It is the command center of all that you think, feel, and do. It weighs approximately three pounds. There are two cerebral hemispheres like you see here on the slide. The left hemisphere focuses on details and logic. For the high-tech folks that are joining us today, it's thought of as the digital brain. The right hemisphere is considered the analog brain, intuitive, broad background, and creative. Did you know that the left side controls the right side of the body and the right side controls the left side of the body? Two additional brain systems include the cerebellum, which is responsible for balance and coordination, and the brain stem, which connects the spinal cord to the brain. It is the most crucial to survival, breathing, pulse, heart rate, blood pressure, sleep, and dreaming. Our brains have several built-in systems for memory making. The first is declarative memory system. These are the facts that we know about ourselves and the environment around us names, nouns, pe persons, birthdays, facts. If there was a strong emotional response to a memory, we're likely to remember it longer. Do you remember where you were when the Twin Towers came down or the Challenger explosion, JFK was shot? 
For individuals with dementia, this system is impacted first. The second system, in addition to declarative, is procedural memory. Have you ever driven home from work and when you pulled up into your driveway, you had no memory of stopping at the red lights? You have done it so many times, you automatically noticed and obeyed the traffic lights. Or how many times a day do you brush your teeth? You learned early on in your development to hold, grasp a toothbrush, place the toothpaste onto the brush, open your mouth, brush up and down, rinse and repeat. Multiply the daily times you brush by 365 days in the calendar year and then by your age. That's a whole lot of teeth brushing. For individuals with dementia, procedural memory is intact longer. Give enough cues, a person's procedural memory may kick in to the best of that person's ability. A more familiar memory system is short-term and long-term memory. Let's take a peek and learn more. Memories are stored deep inside the brain in the hippocampus region. The word is taken from the Greek because the hippocampus actually looks like a seahorse. Here on this slide, I get it. It looks like a puzzle piece, but it really does look like a seahorse in an actual brain. One way of thinking about the storage capability and in the importance of the hippocampus is to relate it in the following way. When you remember something, it's like switching on a video recording. The neurons are the video that memory is recorded on, and the hippocampus is that red button on the phone that says video. When your brain wants to remember, the hippocampus starts the recording process. Neurons begin videoing the information. Unless the hippocampus in the brain has time and ability to switch on the recording mechanism, the memory won't be stored. Short-term memory actually is fragile. It only lasts about 30 seconds. So when you're distracted by another thought, sound, or sight, or there's functional changes, your most recent short-term memory may not be stored. How about an example? Someone can remember the greatest details way back in 1960. Well, that's long-term memory. Short-term memory challenges are someone just eats, someone asks them, hey, how was your lunch? And they look at you and say, I haven't eaten in days. Short-term memory. In addition to normal brain age shrinking, which starts in our 30s and 40s, oh boy, dementia causes physiological changes to the brain in both size and weight. The lobes of the brain, as you see on this slide, have specific functions along with crossover help from other lobes in the brain. We call that redundancies. This means damage to one area of the brain due to dementia may not wipe out total function. Those trillions of connectors that I mentioned before, that those transmitters, they'll reroute to find another way to move the message along. Pretty amazing. It may take longer, that message, and as the dementia progresses and impacts more parts of the brain due to cell death, more changes occur, which may affect function and abilities. So what is dementia? Think of it as the umbrella term with all types and diagnosis of dementia underneath that umbrella. In fact, there are well over a hundred different types of dementia. So that umbrella, think big, think beach or golf umbrella. The word dementia is taken from the Latin, D, away from, and men's mind. It is a group of symptoms. These symptoms may include memory loss, language, problem solving, and other thinking skills that interfere with a person's ability to perform everyday activities. Symptoms may include one or more of the following that you see here on the slide. So object recognition and identification. Examples would be if a person may mistake shaving cream for whipped cream, what could happen at that point? Or more seriously, mistaking a razor for a toothbrush, as well as recognizing people. Motor activity is pretty it's self-explanatory, gait, posture, shuffling. There may be changes in language use. Remember those declarative items that I mentioned that impacts people with dementia earlier on? 
nouns, slang, word salad, and empty speech. An example would be the improper use of words that help name, describe, or define. So it's, you know, ah, it's, it's that thing that holds coffee for the word cup. There may be changes in ability to learn, plan, or identify. I use the term SOAP, the acronym SOAP, to remember the following words, sequencing, organizing, abstracting, and planning. Examples could be having a bra placed over the blouse versus underneath, organizing, putting pants on prior to your underwear. An example of abstract thinking, placing a shoe in the microwave. Why would someone put a shoe in the microwave? Well, when you think about it, the microwave is a space with a door that stores things. A closet is a thing, a space with a door that stores things. There may be changes in the ability to keep track of time. A person may not take cues from the environment as to the time of day, mistaking 3 a.m. for 3 p.m. or vice versa. There may be a change in the ability to think through facts logically. I need to go to work. Understanding what our senses are telling us about the world around us, as in making, may use the big picture to make a conclusion. An example would be the air conditioner, air conditioner is on, the room is cold, it must be winter. So we're back to the umbrella. The umbrella and the term for many types of dementia are grouped under that umbrella. The most common types of dementia are seen here on this slide. Keep in mind that symptoms, characteristics, brain areas affected, average age of occurrence and durations vary by type. As an example, Alzheimer's disease. It's the most prevalent type of dementia with 60 to 80% of all dementias being of the Alzheimer's type. There is an estimated six and a half million Americas Americans age 65 and older that are currently living with Alzheimer's dementia. It's estimated that by the year 2050, that number will go and rise to 12.7 million. Alzheimer's disease begins typically in the temporal area of the brain and hippocampus and spreads throughout the brain. Other examples, vascular dementia. The brain areas affected vary based on the locations of those little strokes. Lewy body, is named just like it should be. Lewy bodies are abnormal deposits of protein that are formed inside brain nerve cells. Frontotemporal degeneration, or known as FTD, not the flowers, come from the two different lobes in which the brain is impacted most significantly, the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. Mixed dementia, as you see on that slide, is characterized by the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and another type of dementia, most commonly vascular dementia. The takeaway here is that changes, rate of progression and expression of symptoms varies person to person throughout the stage of the disease. Why is the bowl of fruit in this picture? It's another way of thinking of the term dementia. We've been talking about the umbrella. You can also think about a bowl of fruit. It kind of aligns with today's theme too. The bowl represents dementia and each kind of fruit is a dementia. Think of the many kinds. Each varies in color and texture, taste, look, size, all fruit, each unique. Every journey with dementia is unique as is every person living with dementia. Caregiver impact. The statistics provided on this slide are from the most recent 2022 Alzheimer's Association report. As you look at this, perhaps you know someone or you see yourself in one or more of these categories. If so, you're not alone. This session is devoted to providing suggestions, strategies, and hopefully solutions to help with ideas and time efficiencies for thoughtful dining for you and your loved one. Nancy? Thank you, Pauline. That was a lot of uh, great information for all of us to consider as we move on to the next portion. Food is universal and connects us to our most cherished moments. I believe loved ones living with dementia benefit by food and dining connections. And Pauline is going to give us a little bit of a background story here on one of our residents in one of our communities. Pauline? I'm 
Thank you. I'm back. So creating cherished moments begins with the person. One of my favorite quotes is the following. It's important to know what disease the person has, but it's much more important to know what person the disease has. When we do this, it helps us inform our interactions and experiences with individuals living with dementia. Knowing the person includes interests, hobbies, habits, and routines, likes and dislikes, values and beliefs, both past and present. In our art and courts world, information is garnered through formalized biographies, family history, and discussions, which are used to invite folks and create engaging programs and interests. Ardella, as seen here, moved into one of our art and courts communities and she attended almost all programs offered. She loved to socialize with peers and enjoyed visits with family. Due to the pandemic, many traditional engagement community events were altered due to safety first precautions. Dell missed family and group events with her friends. The staff at the community recognized that Dell's circle of support was altered and they wanted to make a difference. Recalling she loved to cook, they asked her to prepare her favorite dish, spaghetti. This is her recipe. It was her favorite recipe too, by the way. The cook at the community served as her assistant, organizing ingredients and boiling the pasta. Dell was joined in this personal pursuit with the friends at the community, connecting her past with her present. While slicing vegetables and grating Parmesan cheese, smelling the delicious sense of cooking and sharing smiles with her friends and peers, she continually mentioned how happy and overwhelmed she felt. Watching Dell taste the finished product she had created was a very special moment. This was what Dell wanted to do to feel useful, helpful, and active. This was truly a day to remember, productive and meaningful. Dell was presented a personalized executive chef apron signed by staff with words of encouragement that you see here on the screen. She keeps it in her bedroom so she can read the messages and recall the event, a true keepsake. Caring relationships are about being present. The spaghetti cooking event helped Dell's loneliness turn to laughter, her sadness turn to gladness. She was overwhelmed with happiness and Dell's story illustrates a supportive community creating comfort and opportunities for success centered on the person. Nancy? Oh, and thank you. That's a wonderful story. Um, keeping up traditions, Sunday meals, summer picnics, and birthday celebrations. Think about it. This will help maintain a sense of normalcy. As Pauline just described, the joy of the familiar, Dell's story is a perfect example of creating meaningful connections. For loved ones struggling with memory loss, joining you, maybe just sitting with you as you cook one of their favorite recipes, a fragrant soup, the comforting look of a platter of chicken and dumplings, or the aroma of a pot roast can help bridge that distance that dementia can create. If a family member with dementia can be involved in meal prep or table setting in a small way, this may give them some sense of purpose, at homeness, usefulness, and belonging. Remember how Dell felt overwhelmed and alone. They may feel like they are still part of the social fabric of your family. Sharing a recipe or a food memory can help older adults with dementia reconnect with their personhood. Family meals have traditionally been a priority for most of us. Continue to have these family dinners. Sharing this time together will help maintain routines. The menu sometimes really doesn't matter. It's about the familiar and comforting experience of sitting around the table even after the plates are cleared, enjoying the time spent together. The Alzheimer's Association is talking quite frequently about the connecting power of mealtime. Unfortunately, dementia often brings several challenges related to eating and nutrition. Changes in the senses of taste and smell can make certain foods, once loved, less appetizing. Planning and preparing regular nutritious meals can become a challenge, so making smart food choices will be beneficial. In recent years, there's been a lot of discussion about the link between what you eat and the risk of dementia. One of the most popular diets today is the MIND diet. It's a hybrid of the Mediterranean diet, which is a heart healthy eating plan, and the DASH diet, which promotes healthy, um, which 
a heart healthy uh, start again. And the DASH diet, which promotes foods thought to be preventative or treat high blood pressure. It is very often recommended by physicians, physicians and experts in memory care. This diet is rich in vegetables, whole grains, fruit, protein, and olive oil. Here are some tips when you arrive at the grocery store to do your shopping. Shop the perimeter of the store. The outer aisles is where you will find the freshest, most farm to market available items. Picture your store, bakery, produce, deli, meat, seafood, and dairy. All are at the edges, the perimeter of that grocery store. So let's focus a bit on the produce aisle. There you'll find a colorful variety of foods to ensure that the right nutrients are being received. When supermarkets, many supermarkets have in-store registered dietitians and they're willing to assist with meal planning. Avoid processed foods. These items are located in the belly of the store. Here you will find your boxes, bottles, and cans of preserved and processed foods. As a professional chef, what inspires me most is seasonal local produce. When in season, shop the farmer's markets. Bring your loved ones along. That local produce grown in its true season, as close to you as possible, always has the best flavor and is the most nutrient dense. When you start with ripe seasonal ingredients at their peak of flavor, kitchen prep and meal planning become simpler. Another suggestion is to shop the seasons of the food. I'm joining you today from the library of our community and you see behind me a um, harvest. This is the local harvest here in Connecticut right now. Most of it purchased this morning and yesterday at the local farms here. Seasonal eating supports your body's natural cycle. Leafy greens, we have kale behind us here, water dense fruits. We have peaches and strawberries, cucumbers. They all help support the body's energy system. So eating food picked at the picked in season really does taste better. It's been allowed to ripen naturally and packed with nutrients and fresh flavor. They also provide optimal nutrition, providing our bodies with a whole host of vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. Eating with the seasons and having and buying local helps to support the environment because it reduces the time and miles your food has to travel before it reaches your plate. So here are some examples of fruits and vegetables. Obviously, depending on where you live, they may vary. Let's start with our current season. Tomatoes, cucumbers, beans, greens, squash, fresh herbs, lettuce, melon, peaches, plums, berries, eggplant. Just yesterday at our weekly all community barbecue, we cooked and served local Silver Queen corn. And let me say, it was a smashing summer hit. The reactions from our residents and staff included, wonderful, amazing, delicious. How did you cook it? It popped in my mouth. I didn't even need butter. For a programming event later today, our residents will be shucking their next batch of corn. We routinely, routinely take advantage of the harvest involving our residents in the age old familiar practice of snapping beans, shelling peas, hulling strawberries, and picking herbs from our garden. You can often hear, often hear stories from their life as they share this time together. Fall, we have beans, cabbage, beets, grapes, broccoli and the squashes, acorn, butternut, pumpkin. Winter, turnips, potatoes, parsnips, Brussels sprouts, onions, apples, and pears. And then in the spring, we get our first taste of local strawberries, asparagus, leafy greens, carrots. Many of these items can be frozen and preserved and canned for use, future use. A real time saver and an economical, budget-friendly addition to your pantry. And these are activities that can be shared with your family member as a project, capitalizing on their current skills, abilities, and interests. Helpful tips on freezing seasonal produce and a succulent salmon recipe can be yours by contacting an Arden Ports community nearest to you. So now we're on to menu planning. Planning menus for the week may sound daunting, but by purchasing multi-use foods from each of these following proteins, several meals can be prepared. A store-made rotisserie chicken is followed with leftovers that can be transformed into soft tacos, easy to hold and eat, added to a soup, 
Sliced chicken can be placed on top of a nice mix of greens as an entree salad. Lean ground meat can be prepared as burgers, meatballs, made into a stew and added to soup. I also suggest purchasing the superfoods, oats, blueberries, nuts, bananas, spinach, peanut butter. They're all brightly colored or multi-purposed for snacking and or meal planning. Brown rice, beans, berries, whole grains, olive oil, broccoli, salmon, tuna, and leafy greens is a mind diet bonanza. Make your salads interesting and colorful. Leafy greens, beets, carrots, quinoa, peppers, cukes, and tomatoes. Remember, everyone is different. Cook what they love. One of the concerns obviously with uh, someone with dementia is weight loss. And food and dining should be more than just three squares a day. Don't forget the snacks. Offer them throughout the day to maintain healthy blood sugar levels and provide additional calories and opportunities for your family member to enjoy. Include raw veggies as tolerated and don't forget the dip. Cheese, hard boiled eggs, baked goods, ice cream, fruit, yogurt, blueberries, a healthy antioxidant can be added to muffins, waffles, and pancakes, or just eat them by the handful. Did you know that cheddar cheese is naturally lactose-free? If you are concerned about a loved one and um, dairy products, cheddar is delicious and again, lactose-free, so it's a win-win. Remember to always include a beverage. Proper hydration is essential to overall health and well-being. If weight loss occurs, focus on high calorie and high protein foods. Promote protein at every meal. Position the protein at six o'clock on the plate for easy visibility. Of all items on the plate, the protein is the one to eat. It has the most nutrient value to it, obviously. Serve high calorie beverages, cream and sugar and coffee or tea, any Starbucks creation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Smoothies, milk, high test sodas, when all else fails, supplement high in calories, a supplement high in calories can be provided in between meals. Another great tip is to drizzle honey on fruit. It looks great and tastes even better. So does whipped cream on desserts, fruits, and beverages. It elevates the look and makes it more appealing. I guarantee it will make a splash with your loved one. Also encourage smaller, more frequent meals. A full plate may be overwhelming. Consider plating one food item at a time or try a smaller plate for folks that may say, oh, I can't eat that much. Or as my mother-in-law says every night at dinner, wow, that's a lot. Dementia is progressive. It is described in stages, early, middle and advanced or late stage. Food and beverages can be modified throughout the disease process to maintain independence as long as possible based on the individual's abilities. Pre prepare fork-friendly options. Cut protein into strips. Avoid spaghetti, fine noodles, and rice. They can be too hard to grab on the fork and hold. Prepare tender cooked potatoes and vegetables. Cut into pieces large enough to spear with a fork. If necessary, finger foods can be prepared for dignity and independence when forks and knives are no longer working. Consider changing out soup bowls with a coffee mug. Adaptive dinnerware can also be considered. Weighted silverware, divided and or scoop plates are additional strategies to use to maintain independence. As difficulties do continue, seek medical advice. Meals can be prepared as mechanical soft, or puree. Beverages can be thickened to ensure a safe dining experience. So let's talk a little bit about the dining experience itself. Be aware of sensory experiences. There are five senses, taste, smell, sight, hearing, touch. There are five types of taste, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and spicy. As dementia progresses, sweet helps cover any strong, bitter taste. There are times adding sugar will stimulate the taste buds, which can encourage eating. 
For some, we have found a dash of sugar on vegetables or protein made a difference with food consumption. Now let's visualize the plate. Chicken, mashed potatoes, and cauliflower. Visually unappealing and will blend together on the plate. Try a colored placemat or colored plates to avoid the all white meal. Or you can do a cranberry glazed chicken, broccoli and sweet potatoes. Not only nutritious, but visually appealing. Keep place settings simple. Place only the utensils and service items needed for the meal. Lighting will impact the person's ability to not only see, but eat their food. Think of the smells in the house during the day, possibly the aroma of bread baking, making a pot of coffee, toast, bacon, cinnamon cookies, banana bread, cinnamon, simmering potpourri. These are all items that will stimulate your loved one and a memory may just pop back up for them. Touch, folding a cloth napkin, the warm feel of a coffee cup, the smooth handle of a utensil, or the arm of a chair. Sound, setting a table, a sizzling saute pan, pouring beverages, closing a cabinet or refrigerator door. TV should be turned off. Soft instrumental music playing in the background can be soothing. Monitor and observe your loved one's meals. Watch for changes in ability to handle flatware, chewing, and swallowing. If you're having one of those hectic days and it leaves you little time for cooking, do something different. A little no frills, no fuss, and focus your time and energy on the person. Dining out may be a great alternative, and here are a few tips. Familiar places with familiar people and staff may be optimal. Choose a restaurant that meets their needs, a calmer, quieter environment, again, familiar, not too crowded or noisy, easy restroom access. Choose an ideal time of the day. Typically, we all have a best time of the day. For older adults, this is usually earlier in the day. Depending on where you live, it could also be the busiest time of the day. Select a restaurant with good lighting so everyone can see the menu. And depending on the person, a menu with pictures of the food may simplify the many, too many choices that they have to look to choose from. Keep the outing short. Your loved one may tire easily. Skip the appetizer, take the dessert home. Don't rush. Look for signs that they're becoming tired. Person and stage specific. Bring helpful dining and personal care items that are person and stage specific. Special utensils, towels, moist wipes, a stylish clothing protector for someone with advanced dementia will maintain their dignity during the restaurant's visit. Ask to be seated at a quiet table or one where your loved one can sit with their back to the crowd. Suggest one or two meal choices that you know that they like. Assist when visiting the restroom and discreetly let others know that your companion has dementia. A card can be printed from various websites um, on, on the internet that says, please be patient. My companion has dementia. Be mindful and watch for changes with your loved one in dining and, and a pleasant, be mindful and watch for changes with your loved one, excuse me. Is dining out a pleasant experience or is it distracting and overstimulating? Look for successful failure-free opportunities for both you and your loved one to enjoy. A delicious meal made with love can draw out a person with dementia and bring them a real moment of joy. Help yourself by preparing those meals and snacks that are tasty, memorable, and always appropriate for you, your family, and loved one. And help and care for yourself by recognizing that at times, a pizza pocket, a Big Mac with fries, a Philly cheesesteak, or other occasional junk food on steroids can be just the trick to achieve that moment of joy for you and your loved one. These gooey items can also trigger memories from the past. Memories are made by serving food prepared with consideration, thought, and love. And food is so much about finding that thread of personal history where it means something to you 
and the person living with dementia. It can nurture and sustain the body and one another. Pauline, do you want to say a little thank you to everyone? Open it up. She's on mute. <laughs> yes, okay, there you go. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us. If you have any questions about anything you heard about, anything in the presentation, or if you're having a particular challenge with dining and dementia, go ahead and type it in the chat room and let's see if we can um, provide some suggestions for you. And as folks are doing that, Kelly, I just want to take a moment and thank Nancy. Nancy's many years of experience came to us um, not in healthcare with her experience. And so owning her own business, she knew the value of how to purchase and prepare and provide in not only a cost-effective way, but also recognizing the interests of people and wanting to make sure that the dining event was spectacular. And when she came into our world with Art and Courts, she grasped on to the many different changes that may happen with people that have dementia and really took time to observe, get to know every single resident as they came into our community so that she could make sure she was making a difference for them. I will never forget an example when talking with Nancy, she was meeting a family and the wife came in with a Dairy Queen big old ice cream spoon you know the long one that is like a tea teaspoon and um she said this is how i help my husband eat every single day well we typically don't have those dairy queen plastic spoons and so nancy found a way of getting a vendor and purchased one of those you know silverware items and she adopted that entire system so that he could maintain the strategy that he was using to be able to eat as independently as possible. It's those little details that really make the difference in terms of meeting the needs of a person that has dementia and how they can live more fully by that progress. So thank you, Nancy, for all that you do. Yeah. Well, thank you, Pauline. And it does, it, it, it happens almost on a monthly or even weekly basis with all of our residents coming in and their special needs. And all of these items thankfully are available to you um, online or at your local uh, pharmacy that would handle medical equipment. You can find all of these adaptive um, silverware and the scoop plates and the divided plates. It's, um, and it's been a big help for so many of our residents and family members are always grateful to see their loved one enjoying a meal, but yet have their own independence and dignity. It's about dignity. And um, you know, we monitor our residents constantly. And as we asked you and suggested that you observe in the dining room while your loved one is eating, you know, are they struggling with the fork? Just, you know, get them a nice um, soup size spoon or a tablespoon and you'll see how much easier. They may, you know, resist. And, and I can give you an example again of my mother-in-law. She, where's my fork? I don't have a fork. Well, she's had some, you know, loss of teeth and she's struggling with the fork. So, and she eats everything with a spoon. So it just, it's just honoring their dignity and, you know, gently explaining, blame it on the doctor. That's what we do. <laughs> Your dentist has told us that you need to use a spoon. A fork isn't good for you. So, and again, it's whatever strategy you need to use, you know, just be mindful that, you know, it's first their independence and their dignity, and you'll see much more success in the dining room and um, they'll be enjoying their meals. Right. Um, the one thing that I, I saw or heard in the presentation is when you're putting your plate in front of your loved one, you want to put the, the protein at six. Why is that, Nancy? Is it because of visual difficulties or do, should we be rotating the plate as they're eating? What's well, your strategy you, on that? Visual, visual difficulties is probably the most, um, and, you know, some residents with dementia may only be able to see what's directly in front of them. So that's the first strategy to put the protein in front of them because that's what they're going to eat. And absolutely rotating that plate when they finish the protein, turn it to the vegetable or to the starch, whatever you think they're going to, um, what they like best. Um, with Again, I'll use my mother-in-law as a reference. She's, she's a vegetable lover. So we'll take the protein and then we turn it. Well, she'll figure it out herself, but some people need the dish to be rotated. Some residents will put a fork down and forget to pick it up again. So you need to cue them. And that's why, you know, 
observing them throughout meals um, is really important. You know, you also have to look for um, the swallowing um, and the pocketing of food. You know, if the cheek starts to puff out like a chipmunk, your loved one is obviously having difficulty swallowing the food and they may not know to stop putting more food in their mouth. So again, it's all about observing them and seeing what their abilities are. But, um, and, and it, it doesn't take long to figure it out because you'll see, you know, and there are some women I've noticed over the years that discreetly, if they can't chew what's in their mouth, they'll take it and put it into their napkin because they don't want to be embarrassed at the table. You know, again, it's, it's really important to maintain your loved one's dignity in any setting. Thank you, Kelly. That was a great question. Oh. Hey, Kelly, to yes. add to that, um, you know, in terms of home health services, if someone is living at home, we typically talk about occupational therapy and, and most people are aware of, you know, an occupational therapist coming in to be able to look at the safety items of a home as well, you know, grab bars, benches, things that can be adapted to maintain safety, but they're also really well equipped in terms of it's like their title of their, their license, occupation. And so how, what are the strategies for them to be productive? And so, you know, seeking a medical referral for an OT, an occupational therapist to come into the home is also might be prudent too, because they do exercises and assess the appeal, a person's visual and spatial field. So mm -hmm. yes, to the six PM location, but sometimes based on their peripheral vision and their space um, orientation, it may be that a person's eyes are going to 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. So they also can help really strategize to be more definitive on that unique individual. So, you know, the, the takeaway from this too is when you're looking at the plate, what is the most important item to be able to start with that you're going to get that food first and then go from there. Okay, I'm gonna to try to do the hands up thing. I, I know no one's typing their things in the chat room, but we have a lot of people with their hands up, so we're gonna try it. Yeah, I don't know, and I, I disappeared somewhere, so I'm not sure where I am on this video, but that's okay. Okay, so the first question will probably be coming from Sarah. Sarah, are you on? You can unmute. Yes, I'm on. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfect, thank you. Okay, What's your the question? reason the reason you're not seeing anything is the chat is disabled. Oh, I see. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. <laughs> but do you have a question? You're, you're more than welcome well, to ask. Um, I'm my, my mother is uh, who I am caregiver for. And probably for the last six months, I have only been able to give her boost. And that's all she'll drink. And it could be anywhere from one high calorie boost up to three per day. Prior to that, I was able to give her baby food. And prior to that, she was eating, you know, regular people food. Um, I, I don't know what this means or what I can do to help her. But like the lady had said, she was chewing food and spitting it out into a napkin. Yeah, you know, if I try to give her real people food. So I know as to, and Pauline can back me up on this. I know as dementia progresses, there are some who experience swallowing, swallowing difficulties. And some of those um, real people foods especially can become a choking hazard. So that's why if we move to a more puree diet, say like a baby food, or even if you um, blended your own food, it might be more safer for the person with dementia, right, Pauline? Yeah, Sarah, I, um, I appreciate your question and observations with that. Sometimes it could be something about the gums or the teeth, the ability to actually swallow. And this is where, you know, you, you reach out to your physician um, and also a speech and language pathologist is trained not only in terms of communication, but they excelled at assessing for swallowing. So it may be something that through your physician, they may ask for a swallowing study for your mom to be able to see the right type of food that she would be able to manage that would be more than the boost. Congratulations on doing the high calorie liquid boost to be able to give her the calories that she 
she needs. Um, so I think you want to be able to determine, is it a mechanical issue in terms of what's going on in the mouth? Is it a swallowing issue? Um, and then how to accommodate to try and give the most optimal food for her based on where she is with her dementia. Does that help a little, Sarah? Yeah, she's on mute, but I'm, I'm sure. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, the next person we're going to go to is Joseph. Joseph, are you there? Yes. Hi, Joseph. How are you doing today? Oh, pretty good. Pretty good. good. I, um, a very interesting presentation. I, I just the only comment, well, um, I had a comment earlier, but I couldn't uh, respond uh, yeah, because it was that. shut down. It was the chat feature. I think the slides didn't move along um, to, I thought there was, I saw her picture, Nancy's picture, it looked like it was frozen. So I thought maybe yeah. there was an issue with the slides. So um, very thoughtful. Um, just a moment. No problem. The, um, I haven't reached any of the severe um, feeding issues like we just discussed, the swallowing food. So thank God uh, I'm not there yet, but I'm anticipating it to occur. So it looks like once we see normal foods being an issue, then it would be the progression would be baby foods like the Gerber baby foods. Is that what we're talking about? Um, Joseph, thank you for bringing that comment up. Um, as you heard Nancy discuss, we try and keep the same foods, but modify the look of the food to again, try and have that person that is maybe struggling or having a little bit of a challenge to be able to have um, independence to continue using that. Food. Let me give you an example. So um, having a chicken breast might be too hard because of cutting it up. So that's why Nancy said, if you make it into strips, that person again could either fork spear it and put it to their mouth or actually pick it up. Sometimes we have a reluctance to think, oh my gosh, they're not using the utensil. That's a dignity issue. But really what we're trying to promote is a, a mechanism for a person to be able to eat as best as they are able. So that that then keeps them being able to hold on to the food and get it to their mouth versus you or someone else having to be there and help feed that person. So that's how we start looking at downgrading and looking at foods that are not only good looking, but palatable to eat. So, um, you know, changing mashed potatoes to tater tots or wedges, things that that would be the first line of defense, I think, that you would look at a regular meal and say, how would my family member be able to eat that? And that's where Nancy came in with, you know, eliminating the rice. You may still be able to do like penne pasta or bow tie because you can, again, spear it um, or be able to look at other items that um, could still maintain a person's independence. Does that make sense? And does that help? Yes. I, um, yeah, the stage we're, I'm in right now, or my mom is in right now is the utensils, you know, using the wrong utensil, like, right. um, you know, uh, or turning the spoon upside down and right. expecting it to hold. And um, so I see this um, slowly creeping in into mm -hmm. the meal time and it's concerning but you know it's a quick fix right it's just say turn please turn the spoon the other way yep. or or don't right. use the fork to cut um, are... and but i think the thing to do is actually do it for them right well you want to you want to wait as long as you can for that right so think about anything can become a sandwich so that way there you can cut the sandwich whether it's in triangles and if, if your mom can pick that up or you can pick it up and hand it to her. So again, she still has the independence to be able to use it. The other thing, Nancy mentioned assistive um, adaptive devices, right? A weighted mm -hmm. uh, um, utensil might be the trick for your mom because regular flatware can be a little, not flimsy, but they're pretty lightweight. Whereas lightweight. if you have a weighted spoon or fork, it feels stronger, you know, and that that mm -hmm. might help her grasp it and use the utensil a little bit longer. Right. 
And, and if she's having more success, success dose of with a spoon, I wouldn't even put the fork on the table, as I had mentioned. Um, you know, if that's just going to confuse her and, and make her think about making a choice, if the spoon works best, then just eliminate the fork from the table setting so that she only has, um, you know, the spoon. And it will, uh, you know, as I said, it, I saw it happen just at home myself, and we see it here all the time. Again, it's about keeping them independent and being able to do for themselves. A lot of our residents that are eating potato wedges or a French fry instead of a mashed potato will still have the ability to put ketchup on it or to dip it into a little, you know, bit of gravy if it's a potato wedge. So again, it's just about knowing the person and, um, you know, talking to them. If they're able to communicate, ask them, you know, is, is there is there something special that you'd like? They, they may just trigger a memory um, and tell you, you know, I really don't like sweet potatoes. Just don't ever give them to me again. So just ask, ask the question and you may be surprised with the answer that you get. How do a follow up is um, how do we prevent uh, the uh, the patient from um, grabbing food with the fingers, you know, like saucy food, um, pizza? Um, it, it's it's really messy. <laughs> yes, yes, it is messy. And my suggestion for pizza would be to take the slice. Um, and cut it into smaller squares so that it's not messy for them. Remember also to keep the temperature, um, you know, down. It, it can't be boiling hot right out of the oven because that's going to cause, you know, a slight burn to the finger. He or she will drop it, and then the mess, you know, will escalate from there. But if you take that slice of pizza and cut it into smaller squares, um, then it'd be easier for them to eat. And again, as I suggested, with gravy, ketchup, or any, you know, uh, ranch dip salad dressing, if you can put it on the side and, and you know, have them, if they're able to dip, that would be a safer alternative and less messy. Oh, rather than put it in the mix. Yes. Keep it, keep yes. it away. Okay. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. Have a little, a little condiment dish on the side or a little cup of ketchup, mustard, whatever, you know, whatever the sauce is. And even, you know, again, as Pauline said, if you're cutting chicken into a strip, strip, and you have a gravy or a sauce for it, it might be even chili sauce or salsa. Um, it'll just um, be easier for them to dip it into the sauce and then eat it. But remember, so like, sure that uh, yeah, sort of like a French fry dip. in the ketchup. Right, exactly. Start, think, start thinking those type of items that you might want to um, have mom try and <laughs> substitute out. You know, uh, it, it'd be easier for her to have a green bean because she can pick that up versus something that would be sloppier from what like, you've described. Like a pea. Like, like, like pea. a pea. Yeah. Yeah. Think about, you know, if you have applesauce versus a banana, what's going to take more time and energy and effort for your mom and also for you? The applesauce, you would have to help her hold the spoon, perhaps, whereas a banana, she can probably peel that and take a bite from. So you start looking at what are what are food types that can automatically be more independent for her, which continues to have her help feed herself versus you having to step in. Right. And there are also so many varieties of apples you know, that can be uh, found in the store in a, a natural juice. If you just drain the juice off, they're sliced and they're much easier um, for the loved one to eat rather. I mean, if she can tolerate a fresh apple slice, then please slice it, but make sure it's thin enough so that it's not um, too much of an effort for her to chew it. But yeah, I mean, finger foods is the natural progression uh, with dementia that they are able to just feed themselves, become, you know, be satisfied. And again, it, I'll say it again, independence and dignity. It's so frustrating when we can't do something for ourselves. And, you know, eating is so important to all of us. And I think um, mom will probably do well with just a few changes. Thank you. All right, good luck, You're Joseph. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, let's go to, um, let's try to have Shireen. Shireen, are you there? Hi. Can Hi. you hear me? I can hear you perfect. Okay. How are you? I'm good. Um, so recently, I, I, there's probably more than one thing happening, but my mom started sitting on the couch and not really eating and drinking. Um, we got her to start eating and she'll drink a little, but she she's not drinking 
water and like orange juice she'll refuse. We finally got her to drink some apple juice and um, we put some of those uh, uh, vitamin C immunity um, powder. But what can we do to try to get her drinking water? L like I was trying different things, soda and <laughs> um, sparkling water so I, and different juices. So I wasn't sure. Uh, I started giving her watermelon and grapes so she has some liquids, but I'm not sure yeah. what to do. Right. Great. Um, is the orange juice maybe too acidic for her? That's what I was wondering, if it might be too thick, if I need to water it down. Or... Yeah, I would uh, say, again, I mean, is she able to drink? She doesn't have any difficulty with um, coughing while she's drinking, say, water or any of the other beverages? No, no. That's why I didn't know if something else was going on, like if... Uh, um, her GI tract or something, I don't know, but. Well, that, that I wouldn't be able to comment on. I just uh, of suggest, course. I would, I do suggest though, um, again, going back to my own circumstances and what I've seen here in 19 years, um, a visit to the dentist may even be, um, you know, you don't know if maybe there's some, some sore in her mouth or, I mean, most, uh, um, most of my experiences is that our loved ones and, and the residents that we care for are not able to communicate to us if there's something uh, going on. Okay. You know, and, and that's, I, I mean, I find the dentists very knowledgeable. They're they're extremely helpful and understanding. And and you know, I know orange juice tends to be a little acidic. I would try what you said, watering it down again, but um, and okay. giving it to her. And um, I know that a lot of residents, when they're um, struggling, and we can get some some vitamins into them with Gatorade. You know, there is also a low okay. sugar, low sugar Gatorade. It comes in flavors that are familiar to them, lemon, orange, fruit, and grape. So I think okay. that you might want to try um, maybe and, something like that to see if that'll, if she tolerates that. Okay. Because we we're unable to take her out. Um, it's been a year or so. She, she wouldn't go to the doctors anymore. So we have a nurse practitioner come in. Good, um, mm -hmm. Do you know if the... Um, but of course, it's not the same quality of care. But how do you, how would you deal with a dentist? Or is there, do you know if there's? <laughs> there, there are some dentists that do house calls, believe it or not. But I, okay. you may want to start with the, the nurse. That's a great, you know, advantage mm -hmm. that you have for her coming in. And she might be able to kind of get your mom to open her mouth and be able to look around too, just to be able to get a baseline on it. A question that I have, okay. was your, was your mom an active drinker of any type of liquids before? She, she liked ginger ale and okay. I tried to give her that, but she, she wouldn't even try it. <laughs> yeah. You know, of, of certain age groups, I know my mother-in-law hated water, believe it or not. And yeah. look at us, we're carrying everywhere we go in our lives today. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and again, the ginger ale triggers a memory for me. I, I remember that was the, um, the salvation. If I didn't feel well, yeah. when I was a little girl, Mine my mom too. would give me, mm -hmm. she would ginger give me ginger ale, ale right. and then she mm -hmm. would actually have me stir out the bubbles with a spoon. And it right. was a clever design from my mom to have me get uh, focused on the ginger ale, not on my belly. Um, uh, so you never know. We never know. And we fail constantly, Shireen. We do. Mm -hmm. we, we're successful one day and we go, we figured it out. And then the next day, you go, okay, we got to start all over out. again. Right? Um, yeah. but, but even that with the ginger ale, maybe not refrigerated, maybe um, oh, tap okay. because the temperature might be too, right. too, she might be too sensitive, but there's no harm in trying the, Hey, let's look and try and get these bubbles out. And, and that will be an event for her and see if she might oh. like it that way. Okay. I, okay. Try. I mean, the bubbles, might be bothering. The, bu the bubbles might be bothering her. Yeah. You who's know? to say? I mean, it could oh, just be okay. as simple as the bubbles. But, you know, the orange juice, again, has, you know, a lot of vitamins in it. So I would try just, you know, watering it down or as, you know, I've heard from some of our residents, why are you giving me this colored water? So, you know, anything <laughs> to get them to drink, because we do know how important it is. But um, good yeah. luck. And do look for a dentist there, depending on where you live. Where are you? Are you in a, a, a large uh, metropolitan area? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, in Silver Spring, Maryland. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Okay. 
So we do have well, an art course that's located in Silver Spring. So you might want to contact that community to find out what dentist they use. And then oh, the okay. Same. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's a great idea. Good idea, Kelly. Great. All right. Thanks, Shireen. I'm going to go ahead and mute you now. Thank you. Okay, so the next one we'll go to if Marie is there. Hi, Marie, are you there? Hopefully she's there. Marie? Uh, here, let me see. See, I told you I'm new at this, so. You're doing great, Cal. Uh, I feel like a radio yeah. DJ a little bit, don't I? Yeah, you do. You sound great. You sound like you're, great too. You're, Shireen you from you know Maryland. I, I really do feel like a little bit of a, yeah. a DJ. <laughs> All well, right, this is our little talk show here. I'm thinking. Okay, so let's there. let's go to Miss Billy D. Millie, uh, Billy D, are you there? I am here. Oh yeah, yeah. See success. <laughs> um, what's your question? Okay, you talked a, a lot about it, uh, adding sugar to um, stimulate um, taste. However. You, could you address um, diabetics? Oh, there you go. I think I left that part out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not intentionally. It was just, um, I, I just skipped over because yes, we did talk about it. And it is an option to use a sugar substitute, whether your loved one is using equal, um, sweet and low. I'm not sure. The colored packages, the pink, the yellow, the blue. Um, those can also be used to sprinkle on your, whether, whether it's the protein or the, the starch or the vegetable, if, um, if that's necessary. Um, you know, you can get, I know another thing that works also, there are uh, low sugar um, ketchups out um, in the supermarkets now. Um, you know, um, I once had a resident that put ketchup on everything. It was really the only way that she would eat. And if that's what works, then that's what we're going to do. So again, yes, you can use the sugar substitute and look for, you know, low sugar um, items like ketchup. Uh, you know, salsas are traditionally low um, in sugar. So I would look for a, a mild salsa. Again, anything that, um, you know, would, would help them and also keep their diabetes under control. But yes, yeah. those little colored packages are perfectly fine to use. The, um, the one that I use the most is Splenda. It's the yellow packet. And that uh -huh. really gets, it's great to substitute that for real sugar in baking. And I've never seen a difference in the outcome of the baked goods. And then when, when you do think about, um, you know, diabetic either diets or we, we call them carbohydrate control diets, sometimes CHO is the little language there. Um, in most cases, we just kind of serve the, the same foods, but we lessen the slices or the amount of to be able to keep things in balance. Um, being at home and being able to have a little more access going in and out of grocery stores too would help as Nancy suggested, just to kind of look at the, the sugar counts on some of these items. Um, but yes, in fact, we, we have actually had like residents who get up and go, they can't sit still. So what we'll do is we'll provide their food for them to go out, but still have something that they are holding in their hand to eat. Because you know what it's like for those that are sitting on this phone call, if you tell your family member, no, you know, it's, it doesn't set into motion probably a really great outcome. So we looked for ways to say yes. And one of those things is, we have actually, I know you're going to grimace, but we've actually put a scoop of mashed potatoes on a waffle cone so that that person can go and eat. And the ability mm -hmm. to put a little sugar on top of it, just like Nancy said, the sugar helps relieve the bitter taste, which is the most pronounced taste that is out there. Um, and so it makes it a little bit more appealing. So hopefully that can help for you as well. I mean, I can tell you in other countries, I mean, potato is made with candy for, I mean, it's amazing. True that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Thanks, Billy D. Uh, let me see if I can't. Oh. Okay, Miss Helen, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, um, Helen. Hi there. Um, my suggestion, I have a diabetic husband and uh, we have used uh, low sugar maple syrup nice mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. and it's a nice flavor and cinnamon is a nice it gives it a little bit of yes. color and nice. that cinnamon is good for diabetics and blood sugar anyway it's good right. for your yes. 
those are two suggestions I have for anybody on that line. Thanks, Helen. Well, thank you very much for that. Yes, and nothing smells better than cinnamon on, on a bowl of oatmeal, on a dish of ice cream, whether it's low sugar, no sugar added. So yeah, we're lucky that we live in this time where so many options are available so that everyone can still enjoy their favorite things in moderation and you know not have any effects on their, their blood sugar spiking. And we do, as Pauline mentioned, the uh, carbohydrate controlled diet where you know if a sandwich is prepared for one of our residents that has diabetes, the sandwich is prepared on, a, on one slice of bread and a half and we're emphasized, you know, larger portions of the vegetables so that their blood sugars remain, um, you know, steady throughout the day. Helen, but did you have you, another Helen. question or you? Um... No, that was, it was just the suggestions I had. Oh, to, uh, thank offer. you. All so right. that's the best part when people help each other. Thank you so much, Helen. Exactly. Okay, next, uh, Mary Lou. Are you there? Okay. Um, my, um, I take care of my brother who has Lewy body dementia. And um, some of my challenges are occasionally he'll take too much in his mouth and choke. Um, I wonder if you had any suggestions on that. I, I always cut his food as small as I can, yeah. but darned if he doesn't, you know, scoop too much on his, on his plate. Um, uh -huh. and then the other question is like, I mean, do you think I should put like a bib on them? It seems so, I don't know, degrading or something like that, but there's food flying everywhere when he eats. Well, as we mentioned in your dining out, um, discussion about a, a stylish clothing protector. And again, there are, um, resources out there. Um, I think one of the companies is Buck and Buck that would have a plaid sort of look that look of a flannel shirt um, protector for your father. Um, you know, there are ways to, um, you know, just have him still look decent and have his clothes after the meal is over. Um, so I would look uh, for, uh, you know, clothing protectors online and you will find those suitable for men. And as far as him putting too much food in the mouth, again, as we mentioned earlier, you know, maybe plate one item at a, item at a time um, give him a smaller utensil to use. Is he still able to use a fork? Yes. Yes. Okay. You know, just, and, and again, just, you know, gently remind him to take small bites, yeah. slow down, drink water in between. I mean, these are all, um, you know, issues that um, have, you know, just been prevalent for me so many times. And, and so again, the gentle cues of take small bites, alternate, take a sip of water or whatever your beverage is at the meal and just slow down, you know, and I know it sounds repetitive and they'll probably get a little annoyed at you for making them, um, you know, for reminding them constantly, but, um, but it does help. And always uh, make sure that if you are chopping the meat that it's moist enough, uh, whether it has a gravy or a sauce or a condiment on it so that it, it's, it's easier for them to, um, to swallow. Uh, it's Got it. It, yeah, moistness will help. On the and one other thing on that, Mary Lou, too, in terms of um, the the protectors, you know, sometimes it's not a familiar item. So there have been times that we have for our gentlemen, we've given them, you know, an apron, like the, the chef's apron that you saw mm -hmm. in the beginning of the presentation without all the little quotes. But, you know, think about the cook that's barbecuing out, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that is a familiar mm -hmm. type of apron um, that might not... Um, be as uh, maybe of interest versus saying I'm not going to wear that. So okay. I, I understand what you're saying with that. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. All right, thank you, Mary Lou. Thank you. All right, let's see. Oops. Just, I know there was some. Sorry, it's my first time doing the hands up thing. Okay, Sharon, are you there? Hi, yes, I am. Hi there, how are you? Oh, I didn't know that that picture would come up. There um, you go, hi. That's okay. <laughs> hey, Kelly, I wrote, I had just written you that the chat was disabled, which you knew already. Um, and my main question was, mom, one of the ways that my brother, I, my brother, I take care of my mom, I live with her and my brother lives about a mile away here in Austin. Um, 
one of the things that we discovered over the last two years is that if we keep a running monologue, she'll eat. Mm -hmm. But if she's talking stories, she won't eat and we're eating. So we both just agreed, okay, we're just going to keep a monologue going. Well, then she'll finish eating and say, wait, you know, I've finished. I'm so sorry. That's so rude of me. Please eat, (laughs) eat, eat. Go, no, mom. Yeah. And, and so we go back and forth, but it, she takes a long time to eat, which is appropriate. She's chewing Mm -hmm. and getting everything. That's good. But that's great. Getting her to go ahead and finish the meal without the stories that we've all heard. And I, you know, I try to go along Mm -hmm. with it. That's our quandary right now. If it's you, want, like you want to encourage them to share those stories, obviously. Correct. It, it, it's pleasant for them, you know, but yes, it can be very distracting, you know, during the dinner or the mealtime. Um, right. And, and again, just I think, you know, letting her take her time and, you know, as long as she's not talking with food in her mouth, you know, hopefully it'll be a safe experience for everyone. Yeah, I'm just I love. About- yeah, I love that strategy. That's great between you and your brother to be able to have that conversation. It, mm-hmm. it, it, it kind of gives her that automatic, I'm going to continue to eat. She's present. She's, you know, engaged because she's eating, but she's also engaged by having her kids with her. It's social. Mm-hmm. It's familiar. It's brilliant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we try. And she's always, of course, saying, no, you don't have to make food for me. And I I, my excuse is, Mom, you made me sit down meals exactly. for 18 years. Exactly. <laughs> sit down that's meals. That's exactly. exactly. I'm thinking yeah. I eat too much when I'm talking too. So I, I think that's a, just a, a brilliant thing to do. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, Thank you, great. Kelly. Thanks, thanks for interacting with me, Kelly, when I write you emails. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I don't mind. I love helping people. So this is great. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all very much. I got a lot of information out of this and all of the webinars I do. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, I see something in the chat here just popped up. Did you see that, Kelly? <laughs> I know. Well, so the thing is, ah. Zoom just did like an update. You know how they do sometimes. And ah. uh, so I just figured out how to disable it. So I apologize. It was my fault. My mom is at the point where she needs to be fed. Sometimes she'll barely open her mouth. Any tips to open it wider so we could get a, fo- a spoon in? Mm. Ah, that's, 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 a, that's a tough one. Um, are we feeding her things that she likes? How do I respond to this, Kelly? Do I type it in or? Who is... Well, hopefully they'll, yes. Yes, okay. Hmm. Well, I would, I would try and peel it back a little bit. Um, hmm. what, what if you were to put some items on the plate that she could pick up by herself, right? I mean, depending on um, her likes, what she what she likes, um, you know, I go back to the quarter sandwich and um, it's something that she could pick up when she wants to. And, you know, sometimes we have to weed out and I don't know the answer to this. I'm just throwing it out there. Mm-hmm. Um, we have to re- weed out the dementia related behavior. And sometimes it could be, you know, I, I'm, I'm in charge here. You're not. And I can, you know, I can close my mouth and you're not going to get any food into me. Um, so you kind of step back and say, well, what else could be going on? Right. And so that's ju- not knowing any other information than what you just shared. Um, you know, you may want to try something that you provide an environment on the plate that she can pick up on her own and kind of step back a little bit. There's no rush and see how she does with it. We, you know, we actually have found that in our communities doing a sensory program where in the dining room, we're assisting our residents more fully, but in the sensory program, if we do a, you know, a a fancy bread and, and cream cheese with vegetables or fruit in it, and we put it into a, you know, a quarter, and we hand it to that person, you wouldn't believe how many of those sandwich squares they're eating. So uh, it's just a, an idea to try and try. Again, we're always trying. We're always, you know, ruling out, but we're not afraid to try it again. Yeah. A person in the chat room suggested maybe um, she could try a straw or a different type of glass, like a non-spillable cup, like mm-hmm. a sippy cup. Yeah, mm-hmm. those yeah, those work very well in, in certain situations. Yeah. And 
Um, Donna, with your with your mom, has has this been going on for a long time that she won't open her mouth? Give her a chance to type in the chat room. Yeah. No, just recently. Just recently. So as Pauline said, I think there may be um, reasons to peel back and see, you know, if there's something else that's going on um, that she isn't able to um, to communicate with you um, enough so that you can figure it out. Okay. Um, there's someone in the chat room. My dad might have forgotten many things, but not how to eat. He eats well, mm -hmm. and we facilitate this by, whoop, hold on, my chat room jumped. We facilitate this by cutting foods, et cetera. The problem is coughing after eating. Who will cough mm -hmm. until he throws up? Generally not mm -hmm. food, but then clear secretions. Is this dysphagia? Is this something we have we live with at 91? Mm -hmm. I, I would definitely get a consult with your mm -hmm. physician in terms of um, kind of a speech and language pathology to pathologist to make sure we're looking at um, his swallowing capabilities and maybe um, looking at downgrading in a way that can help facilitate not having the, the coughing to the point of throwing up. It might be, you know, I'm not saying it's this way, but it, it could be a little thicker liquid so that even though it's going down, it's still coming up. And that's what the speech therapist is able to do is to kind of look at the mechanism once it passes the mouth and gets swallowed and it goes down into the esophagus, what's going on back there. So mm -hmm. that's yeah. an option to do. Check it out through someone that's trained for that. What are your yeah. suggestions to keep my husband occupied while waiting for a meal in a restaurant? Sometimes he fiddles with items on the table, like the cream, the ketchup, the jelly, et cetera. Uh, my first thought is if it's a restaurant that you frequent and you're familiar with and they're familiar with you is to call ahead and order. He can still sit down at the table and look at the menu and go through the motion of picking out what he wants. And hopefully it's what you ask them to prepare. But I think that would help. And if there's any um, activity that he likes, maybe a deck of cards or does he do word search puzzles or crossword puzzles, just something that, um, you know, would keep him occupied during that time. But I would just suggest, you know, getting in touch with the restaurant and trying to have them have something prepared. Yeah. Um, there. Okay. My dad doesn't know when he is satiated. We give him a reasonable meal and then he helps himself a lot to more field yeah. food after the meal. Could this be dementia related? Um, yeah, may I go just quick and then Pauline, yeah. Finish. yeah, they forgot. He forgot that he had already eaten. You know, it's just that peanut butter cracker or can I have a hard candy after you just finished dinner? Pauline, go ahead. Yeah, um, I've, I've experienced this as well. And so... I remember we had an ice cream Sunday festival and a particular resident came back and on the third time coming through with the ice cream social, I was like, whoa, because she wasn't remembering that she just ate all of that. Um, so, you know, the, the, one of the strategies that you might want to entertain is um, still providing, still saying yes, but in ways that um, maintain their own uh, again, the word comes up as dignity, right? Is that yeah. give items that are not high in calories or things that are going to, you know, impact him. So in our case, um, when things like that happen, we reach for, you know, crackers or fruit to be able to kind of provide that so that they're still getting some type of food, but it's not the same big meal that they just consumed. Again, trying to move in that direction or, and, you know, a beverage being able to kind of give that, mm -hmm. Hey, how about a cup of coffee or an iced tea or something? Um, just so that they have something that they're being able to eat. They, in most cases, they just don't remember that they ate it. Right. And yeah. another idea is to keep them occupied or um, distracted. You know, if they're able to help you with clearing the table or, um, you know, maybe putting some of the dinnerware away or go for a walk or sit out in the yard, just something to distract them from that, that, you know, after, right after dinner. Yeah. yeah. So from the environment where, you know, I, I know that, again, just being outside, you know, we'll just, they'll start listening to the sounds of the, you know, the environment and it just may be, uh, it may be helpful. But as Pauline said, there are times where, you know, nothing is going to work, but that, you know, piece of hard candy 
and to make it easier for yourself, you know, there's really nothing that will satisfy them but that at the time. So sometimes you don't have a choice and you have to do yeah. it. Yeah. So, so what, one of the comment, one of the things that Nancy just shared for those that are on the line is a redirection, right? And so sometimes the redirection can be you honestly looking at your family member and say, I'm, I'll be glad to get you something, but could you help me with this first? Or I'll sit with you, but I need to get the dishes done or clear the table or anything if it's still in the kitchen area um, or do something else. And in, in that time frame, they may, again, not will, but they may get distracted at that point and not recall that. You know, so that's another way of thinking about it. And for the woman in the restaurant, uh, we had a suggestion in the chat room um, that they asked the chef in the restaurants to cut the meat before it gets to the table so they could retain their dignity. It works mm -hmm. that well for them. So I'm glad that she shared that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, um, I know that we went past a little bit of time, but I think we helped a lot of people out there that might have had a little bit of uh, challenges as far as dining and dementia. So I want to thank our friends, uh, Nancy and Pauline, for joining us today. I hope that everybody can join us for our next, <laughs> our, next, our next webinar, which is on Thursday, September 1st at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, where we're going to be joined with Dr. Tam Cummings, our one and only favorite. And she is going to be talking about a really important subject called um, talking to teens and young adults about dementia, which is something that I don't think a lot of people discuss, but in our, um, the, our environment of dementia nowadays, we're coming across that, whether it's grandchildren, whether it's a, a young adult who's taking care of their parent that might be suffering with early onset dementia, it's just something that's becoming a little more common. Um, so I hope that you all can join us for that webinar. Or the information for that webinar and registration uh, information is on our virtual events website, as well as um, this event that is pre-recorded and will appear on our Library of Dementia webinars in a couple of days. So thank you to our panelists today, Nancy and Pauline, and I hope until we all meet again next time that everybody stays well. Thank you so well, much for joining. Uh, Kelly, can I, just type, can I just type an answer to this um, RH here? Before or you, you could just say the, say the answer if you want. Oh, I can just say it. Okay. Um, I would suggest um, if that's an urgency to take your loved one to the bathroom. I know it's distracting, and but better in the bathroom than an accident, um, you know, at the I'll table. Try. So I, I would I would just take him or her to, uh, I think you said your mom, to the bathroom if that's where she has and, the oh. And with all of that, just to tag team, if this is a common practice, if you're not already doing this, you may want to have her go to the bathroom before you sit down uh -huh. for the meal as well. Yeah, yes, that might be a good exactly. strategy too. Yes. Okay. Thank that, you very then, much, everyone. Yes, so thank you very much and be well. Take care. Thank bye you. Bye-bye.